of parts that are RNA based. And we don't quite have that worked into the system yet. I guess in, in part my question might be relevant if you have interactions and problems that you only note at some higher level. It, you might want to, it might be helpful to look back at the crystal structures at some point. That's correct. So the general version of that, of course, is that when you have flaws in the design, at the design level, you're going to go back and say, you said that, first, you're going to want to try to, to debug it at the design level. And you might do things like say, well, I, it doesn't seem to work, and it doesn't seem to work right here because this input doesn't seem to be doing what I thought it was going to do. Let me get rid of that part because maybe the guy who made that part was a loser. I'm going to use this other part and see if that works. And you find out that it does work. And now you say, well, I'll have, you know, I'll have some patience with the guy who designed the part and tell him what happened. And then you can hunt down what the flaw is. A lot of parts that are possible and good, are, look good, are going to actually be not usable in the system or are going to need a lot of modification. That's okay. Related question to that, how about trying to seek out uh, homologous genes and thermophiles and other nice stable things? I mean, if you work just with the stuff out of E. coli, you're going right. to run into these That's right. That's right. Yep. The, the question was, how about seeking out uh, genes from other species, uh, other environments, thermophiles, all those kind of things? Uh, the answer is the parts guys, you know, find anything you can, and the, the system designing people will be happy with that as well. Am I ignoring people over there? Uh, <clears throat> so I was just wondering if you had... Uh, if you had a way to generate variants of parts rapidly so that you could you could use uh, directed evolution when you needed to to do to you know to let the bug do the fine tuning for you when you when you had the ability to select and screen and so on yeah we haven 't been doing that uh, here at MIT. I believe that some of the groups this summer are going to be doing some of that and we actually talked I talked to uh, Andy Ellington about making some uh, either sections, parts that are uh, libraries, where it's actually not a pure sequence, and also making sections that are specifically designed to harness and make use of evolution. I, I know this, um, that you've given some thought to this, but just to, you know, maybe say it out loud to the group. Um, there ought to be some means to facilitate a one-time strip mining of, say, the minus 80 freezers at the Molecular Sciences Institute, the minus 80 freezers in Ron Davis's. How, you know, th those biologists who are parts oriented, who are halfway toward where you want to be, mm -hmm. make it easy for us to do the one time turnover thing. Uh, and and in, in one pass, you can capture, you know, you can expand. So, right. so, you know, set up that mechanism so that we can meet you halfway. Right. I think to the extent that the registry becomes an organization that has some budget and some staff, then, you know, I'm sure that people would like to, you know, make some design and then do some initial characterization of it, but have the quality checking all happen and maybe cross kind of, uh, kind of interference checking happen, you know, at the centralized location. Okay. Alrighty, so the next step is to invite the, the leaders from the different uh, summer groups to come up. And what I'd like to do is first find out kind of what is your team like, uh, th then how hard was it to you know, recruit the students, what do you think you're going to do, what do you think your particular group is uh, particularly good at. Drew, do you want to be ours? Somebody's going to have to bring an extra chair. There's only four. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, the contest is a cooperative competition. Okay. It's the first time, right? So don't go too nuts. There's one person missing. Did Collins pick somebody to represent the group? Okay, okay. Go on. 
Uh, so the, the cooperative competition is to design genetically engineered finite state machines. <coughs> and the finite state machines means that it has internal state so it can take its input and do things with it, so gates, flip-flops, that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the next question is, how, how do we decide who won? Okay, and that is by whoever makes the coolest system. Okay, nice objective measure. And I suspect we're going to have a nice big fight when the time comes. But that's the plan. Okay, so can everybody remind, we want to start at the end and tell them who you are and where you're from. And sure, uh, my name is Jim Flanagan. I'm in, uh, at Boston University. Uh, Jim Flanagan at Boston University. I'm part of Jim Collins' lab. Um, and I guess we may be at an earlier stage than some of the teams, but uh, we're... Uh, we're, we're most... Uh, we're leaning toward doing some kind of counter mechanism. And uh, that might be all I can say at this point. <laughs> how, big is, how big is your team? Um, I think we're about six people. I mean, okay. we have about four graduate students. I, I would be one of those. And uh, we have, I think, three undergraduates. OK, so that's like seven? Yeah. So <laughs> this is a check. OK, that's good. So correct in biology. So it's, I'm it's trying to, a, I'm it's to get a stochastic team. How, how, how hard was it? What did you have to do to get the people to want to do this? Um, I'm, you don't know. Okay. No, I'm, I'm actually not the right person to, to answer that question. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So uh, I'm Ron Weiss from Princeton, and um, I'd like to start with thanking the people that are involved because I managed to uh, not put my acknowledge, acknowledgement slide last time, so I'll start with that this time. Um, so Joram Gertzman, say hi. So he's organizing, spearheading this. Uh, and then we have Sarah Hushengi. Say hi, Sarah. Okay. She, did, she does research, too. Um, and Subaya, who are helping to instruct, and they're putting a lot of time into this. So we're doing a tag team uh, instruction. Uh, we have seven people. We have uh, one grad student who's actually a biologist, and we have uh, six undergrads. And we have mostly um, people from Princeton. We have two people uh, not from Princeton. Uh, what else do we need to know? What are the other what, questions? What kind of oh, thing do how you do we recruit them? Yes, how do you what recruit we, them? Okay, the recruitment went by uh, the biologist, the grad student, uh, is a now first year going to second year. So I said, okay, you should learn about this. This is a good, quick way to do that. And the other way we rec recruited people is uh, we made a poster and I took it to my logic design class. And I said, this is what we're doing. And so we got lots of responses just like that. And so we didn't have to do a lot of advertising. And we filled up rather quickly. Um, other, qu uh, so other questions? Do you have an idea of what your team is going to be, you know, what special uh, direction you're, you're thinking okay. about, or is it too early? So uh, we don't have an idea yet. Uh, we started, so it's a 10-week program. We were not sure right away uh, how long we want to do a program, but then I think for the summer, really, 10 weeks makes sense. We thought about having a four-week program, and it, it really doesn't make sense in terms of people in the summer actually have to have a job. So we're going to consider this as their summer job, um, and that means funding and so on. Uh, we started on Monday. We don't know what we're going to do yet. Um, you know, people talked about counters and so on. We always have, you know, we have this bias for cell-cell uh, communication, so we'll see if we can integrate that into the counting <coughs> scheme somehow. Uh, we, um, one other point is, um, you know, the modeling point, I think. I just wanted uh, to also try to, you know, understand that in terms of, uh, you know, building the right modeling tools for our purposes. And uh, I mean, I think it's great that the BioJade is available. Um, I also like to uh, find out about the other simulation tools. We're building uh, some simulation tools uh, based on um, Simulink and MATLAB. So, um, so I was trying to actually figure out whether it makes sense to, to have a single one. So obviously it doesn't make sense to have a single simulation tool. It makes sense to have 
uh, multiple places design different simulation tools at different levels of abstraction uh, because we don't know what's going to work yet. Uh, which also gets to the question of um, how are we going to populate the database and what are the right parameters and whether, you know, TIPS is the right parameter to use as the level of abstraction, uh, you know, uh, high to low, low to high, what are the thresholds and so on. So I think all those kind of interesting issues are going to be worked on, clearly not resolved, uh, but worked on this summer. So we're very excited about this. Okay. Uh, so I'm from Texas. Um, I'm a graduate student in Andy Ellington's lab. Um, I'm and your name is? Oh, Jeff Tabor, by the way. Um, and so we've kind of been going about this really informally. Uh, Andy came to a preliminary meeting in January um, where they outlined this competition. And he kind of came back and just talked to a few people and got a few people excited. Um, and so therefore, we're kind of grad student um, heavy. Um, and then we, we try to recruit undergrads thereafter. Um, and so we've been basically treating it like a journal club, like meeting once a week actually since since early on, since like February. Um, and I came to find out no one else has been doing anything about this until the summer. And so we have an unfair advantage, but after seeing, you know, Jim Collins and Ron Weiss talk and Mike Olivitz, I'm completely afraid. And uh, <laughs> I, I think we'll need all the head start we can get. And so... Um, How many students are there? Students. So... So, like I said, it's kind of like a journal club where we just get together and have fun and talk and bounce ideas off each other. And so, I guess like 10 to 12 people show up to that, um, including like a couple faculty and, you know, a couple undergraduates. Um, but then the core kind of group who's working on it is going to be about six um, who will actually get in the lab and start um, trying to make the thing work. And so, um, we're, we're kind of a diverse group. We have like two, two biologists two computer scientists, a physicist. Um, so we have a diverse background, and we've actually spent time. It's been good. We've been able to teach the computer scientists um, how to do biology, like get them to the bench and actually teach them how to clone. Um, and they're having a good time implementing these abstract ideas to them um, physically. So um, they've had a good le learning experience. So, Do you have an idea of the direction that the system might Go or do is that a secret? For no, not at all. I've been sharing it, you know, profusely, um, <clears throat> su such that it'll be even easier for everybody else to outdo us. But uh, so, so we tried to solve, um, you know, with with influence from our computer science people, we tried to we tried to show off um, in terms of biology, like what what would be biology's advantage over over silicon computers and we figured massively parallel computation is, is a good approach so you can make really cheap a ton of bacterial computers um, and have them all perform the same simple computation in parallel and if you can take advantage of that then um, that might be a, a cool way to implement or, or a cool way to go about doing this so um, you want me to explain the uh, idea that's okay that's okay, okay. So, so it's like it's trying to show off you know if biology could ever outdo computers um, computationally, which it probably never will, we think this might be, you know, kind of a scheme for 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 how that might develop. So. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Michael Elowitz. I'm starting a new lab at Caltech this year, and uh, at Caltech. I guess the effort has been really led by Richard Murray, who's the head of the Engineering and Applied Science Division, and he's extremely excited about this. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, two of us, uh, myself and Christina Smolke, who's uh, also a new assistant professor uh, in engineering, um, we've been trying to put together something, um, a component of the program. And uh, I think f the Caltech component sort of is divided into two pieces. Um, we have about three students, undergrads, who uh, are going to just go into my lab and Christina's lab and try and do, uh, just spend a summer doing uh, a, a project, including all the molecular biology components. Um, and then we have, I think, about seven or eight other students who are going to uh, operate more along the model of uh, the previous MIT classes. In other words, break, break up into groups, try and put together projects, think about you know, weird ideas, and uh, hopefully maybe order some of these pieces to put them together. Um, we also have a couple of uh, graduate students who are helping out, including Jeff Endelman, who's here, yeah. over there. <laughs> and um, 
I think actually our, I think, I guess our program starts this week. And so we will soon know what it's going to be like. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see. I think it's uh, still in flux, but uh, everyone's pretty excited. So, What do you have to do to get the students to sign up? Uh, I think Richard Murray is incredibly uh, charismatic, persuasive, excited, and I think he's done a great job kind of uh, recruiting people. I don't know what his specific tactics are, but somehow I think the group, he got together an uh, excited group of people, yeah, just, just by his enthusiasm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jerry points out that mostly you can attract students by just putting food out, so <laughs> there's a chemo taxes kind of thing. Okay. Thanks. Right. So I'm, I'm Drew Endy. Um, a team at MIT, there's 12 students. Uh, they've given themselves a name. They should really be up here doing this. Um, they've given themselves the name SMUG, uh, which I believe stands for Self-Replicating Machines of Undeniable Greatness. Um, <laughs> undeniable Genius, excuse undeniable me. Genius. Uh, or something like that. Um, it's a mix of graduate and undergraduates. Um, they were recruited uh, via email to the biology, biological engineering, and electrical engineering uh, department uh, student groups. Um, and from that, I, I think we interviewed over the course of a day um, several dozen folks uh, and just looked for uh, the right mix of people who we thought could work well together. Um, we started on Monday and uh, met for a couple days uh, to go over a lot of the ideas that were described this morning. Uh, but the team is running itself, and they're working on the theme for their specific project and hoping to come up with something good. Um, I think the, the strengths that we have here are our um, uh, tenacity with trying to implement some formal engineering framework in biology, and our, our weaknesses are we need to get a lot better on characterization, debug, and directed evolution so we can make things that work. So is there anything anybody else would like to, to say about this? Or do you want to take questions from the audience? I mean, I guess uh, one quick question is that uh, in terms of trying to understand how to really build st systems, and uh, the, the point that Drew brought up is a, an important point in terms of the fact that building system means design, synthesis, testing, going back to design. So I think it's a real challenge to try to understand that how to do that, certainly within four weeks, which is impossible, but uh, 10 weeks and so on. And if people here have good ideas about how to do that, uh, I certainly would like to hear about them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there questions for the group? Uh, in the comic books from which so much of this is derived, uh, the... Um, you know, the, 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 the notional question of how uh, uh, Dr. whatever his name is recruits his hench people is uh, the answer to that is that he promises them power because <laughs> you can't pay them enough. So the question is, uh, I didn't hear any of you say that you promised them power. Uh, were you implying it or hinting it? Or are their motives so pure? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the youngest one here? <laughs> yeah, so uh, being the youngest and being the, mo the most um, uh, powerless, I, I was power, power hungry. Yeah, so I was basically strong armed into it. I didn't have a choice. Um, I would have chosen to do it on my own, but I didn't have that choice anyway, so uh, I don't know how everybody else does it. So. I think at Caltech, they're generally lured by high risk. Uh, I think that's the, the fact that it's unlikely to work, I think, is the attraction. <laughs> I, it's not something I understand myself, but it, it's kind of a. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question, actually. Okay. Um, when you judge, so how many points do you get for cool design versus something that works? <laughs> 42, right? <laughs> it's going to be. Huh? Yeah. Oh, well, certainly we have to allow for them all not working. Uh, it's a definite possibility, I'd say. I mean, I think uh, we should have more than one entry, right? Right. right so we should have coolness. What are the other entries? Working. Uh, working. 
Yeah. Well, we, we're not guaranteed winners, right? There's, we don't have to have a winner there. There's always um, most improved, I think. <laughs> <laughs> most likely to work. Tried hardest. We might have more than one award. <laughs> <laughs> Will you have five awards then? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> this one? Thank you. One of the concerns we had at Caltech when discussing where to take the project was uh, the MIT model seems to have been very, ha had a strong emphasis on the modeling part of the project, and the students really never got to see whether the designs that they worked so hard at would actually work, and what what blend between having good designs and then also being practical about what could possibly work if you built it, should we be trying to emphasize this summer in the competition? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, we, we actually discussed this, so I think this is a great point, because uh, it seemed to me that eventually, if nothing works ever, it's, this thing is doomed to failure. So I, it is important <laughs> that, uh, I think it's important for, for the learning experience, for everything, that there be aspects of it that work. And so I think at Caltech, one of the things we've talked about is kind of maybe making more modest goals as well as more crazy and ambitious things and having kind of a range of, uh, a range of goals. So. Do other schools think that's worthwhile to introduce that? We, we kind of partitioned it to, I think, two segments. One of them, so I guess small scale integration, the other one, I guess medium scale integration. And, you know, maybe actually having something at the small scale actually, you know, produce YFP when we want it, I think would be nice. And so maybe that should be another entry is you should categorize things, say that, uh, you know, one entry is what can you do with three components, you know, and that should be, that should be one category. And then there would be then open weight category or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> There's also there's also the statistic of you know how many how many functioning parts and devices did you contribute, um, and, and that might be something useful. But to pick up on on, on another thread, um, in setting up the two IAP courses and then the summer competition, there was this this question of choice of theme, and so uh, with the first IAP course based on Michael's existence proof, right, it was oscillators or blinkers. And I think in hindsight, the blinker problem. Um, was a hard problem, meaning meaning you either get an oscillator or you don't. Um, in contrast, the pattern formation problem is much more open-ended, and it, along the way, you can hit intermediate goals, right? So you could have a spot, you could have bands, you could have a bullseye, uh, you could spell out MIT, you could spell out your name, uh, and so on. And it just sort of extends in a way that that it feels like the systems turned out to be easier to grow on. Uh, and I think some of Ron's success, you can you can see that playing out. Uh, with the finite state machines, it's still more open-ended, um, and I think you know just a, so just a, a quick comment on on the relationship between you know, choice of theme and, and chance of success and chance of incremental success. So I like our chances, but we've got a lot of work to do. I mean, I keep saying that, but you know, it's like there's a lot of work to do. And we also at MIT make sure we have a lot of freshmen, so they don't actually know what you can't do, and that that gives you an enthusiasm that's very valuable. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. Let's go to Aaron. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if this is a fair question or not, but to, but suppose you go back in time, Randy, and you know when you um, and Tom and the others were, were young, and you had the parts list, and um, whoever were the were the young forward-thinking people ran an IAP session where you got to play with the parts that were in those catalogs that were available. What then would you have tried to make and demonstrate that you that you would have thought then was a really important contribution to where you all perceived the field was going? Well, so, I think so I mean, it's clear what I'm asking in the sense that at, at some point, when do you go beyond making? This is going to sound like I'm dissing it, but you know, go, go beyond making cute things that look like yeah, here's my new here's what my new baby looks like. Well, that's, Vers that's versus which. Right, which is, you got to do that at, some, at, at the beginning, but when, when do you leap to the next stage and say, Here, here's the great thing I'm doing in this field for, you know, for, for this end? What? Well, that's a great question because there is a parallel to this, which is in uh, around 1980, uh, the world of VLSI 
uh, VLSI having 100 transistors uh, was something that you could only do in industry. And as a result of being able to only do it in industry, computer architecture in universities was starving a little bit. Uh, you could read about things, then go get a job, and then maybe you could build something. Uh, Carver, Mead, and Lynn Conway made a series of courses which m made the VLSI technology available to students. And they did as much like the, pro like the courses we're having here. The first one, uh, I think, only one thing worked, and maybe not even completely. Probably half of them, the students had graduated by the time their thing, their project came back. They designed simple things. Uh, but in the successive classes, very quickly, people made a display controller. Uh, there was some work on optical mice, and which is uh, way out of the box kind of thinking. And that all led to the uh, the the risk reduced instruction set computer activity, which of course has been influential to the whole industry. But I want to IBM end this separately. Actually, I want to you know. There's the question of you know when do we make at what time do we make or or mm -hmm. agree that we can never make useful artifacts that you know people will clamor for. But the flip side to all of this, which is obvious from from Michael's work, for example, is even these very simple systems are extremely powerful tools for asking basic scientific questions. And, and so, you know, you could say, well, these are all toy problems, but, you know, wow, uh, what good toy problems to be working on. Um, okay. Yeah, um, it, I want to kind of uh, blow past what you just said, Randy, the Carver Mead uh, story, which I first heard from you guys. Uh, for me, uh, I want to blow past it while, while dissing it. Um, that, uh, you know, the difference here is, of course, those poor students who weren't able to do VSLI in the university were able to go to companies which were making widgets, uh, which were selling products for which there was a market. Uh, so, you, you, you know, you didn't have the same task of uh, defining this playful curriculum for people and defining the devices that would eventually constitute markets and useful apps. Uh, you know, some new apps came from play, but... Um, but but there was there was clear precedent that this would be important. Um, in the spirit of Eric's comment, uh, if you won't go for apps, one criterion that you know I would personally uh, want to see in the second or third year of such a this competition like this is speed. Uh, I'm I'm now going to dish you a little bit, Ron. When uh, I met you, it was with Drew, and we had gone to this conference in Princeton, and somebody asked you about how fast your simulation worked, and you said. True, the device performs in the millihertz range. And that kind of stopped all thought for about two or three seconds, and then everybody realized what it meant. <laughs> Why are we competing on speed? I, I don't think I don't those. I mean, I actually, you know, when I was going. One aspect of utility, if you won't define an application, define criteria. Well, so speed is. Help make a device I mean, is it, is it development time? Or is it order of days? So, I mean, if, if you have clock speeds that are millihertz, um, then, you know, that's okay if you're talking about applications that take days. Um, I think that, you know, clearly uh, transcription has a problem. Let me just point out that when I was going around giving job talks, and I specifically did not want to talk about speed. Because <laughs> uh, and some places, you know, some places actually, you know, I told me later on that that's one of the issues that came up. What is, what's the RC constant? And, I, uh, you know, is that relevant? Uh, you know, in terms of understanding these devices, yes, it's relevant. Uh, it is not, it's going to allow us to do certain kinds of applications. If we're going to go to something that does much faster, uh, that has much faster response time, then we need to go to uh, different types of devices, phosphorylation and so on. And, no, it is clear, and, you know, we started working on that actually, you know, when the limb is, you know, doing really uh, good job on that, um, stuff that Homi Alinga working on protein-protein interactions. Those are critical, and I think that we have to also integrate those into the parts registry. We have to understand we currently don't know how to make those modular as we know uh, by now, but we should still put them in, even though we don't know how to uh, think about composing them. So there's, a, there's, there's any number of statistics that can be imagined, right? Speed, uh, number of components, how well they work together. 
uh, and we just have to, you know, we're still doing the work to figure out what combination of those will be the most productive. I think the, there is a, oh, I think there is a clear next stage. That clear next stage will be that at any of the schools around in the country, you can run an IAP-like class for a month, and the systems that the students build will function. They may have bugs that they put in, but the inverters and the flip-flops and all of those things work like inverters and flip-flops. And when we get to that plateau, then you really have separated the designers from the parts engineers. I, I wonder if you're anticipating when the happy days of open source run into real success. <laughs> that is to say, when you really start, whether it's this year or next year, I don't know, you tell me, but where, because on the computer analogy, where you're really getting something terrific to happen and then the money and the prestige and the rest start appearing on the, the, the screen. I don't know. It, to some extent, the Unix world persisted kind of before, through, and even after the entire Windows and closed source activities. So. The FSF started in 1982. <laughs> okay, and that's the beginning of, of free software. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, I, I think one issue that's kind of sitting under the surface here is there's an issue of, what, of clarity of purpose or lack of clarity of purpose with this whole field. Because with computers, I think there was lots and lots of applications that were immediately obvious. Here we have vague ideas of possible applications. And like my own motivation for getting into this in the first place was a scientific motivation. We're looking, we're trying to understand how cells work. We see these uh, circuits in the cell that are enormously complex, and we need a toy model system that we can play with in order to understand general principles. So the scientific purpose is relatively clear, uh, even though in science it's often hard to say exactly what you're going to learn by you know, in this way ahead of time. Uh, from the engineering point of view and from the point of view of these courses, um, it's also clear that we, that we need to build an infrastructure in order to be able to do things, but it's not exactly clear what the final end goal is. And I think that maybe that is contributing to this, this, this feeling that I'm sensing, I don't know if, if other people feel this as well, that it's not exactly clear what the objective is that we're, we're trying to do as a, as a community. I, I just want to make a comment on that. It's easy to think now in 2004 that the applications of, say, the Internet and computers are obvious. But, you know, now we have a lot of them. We've been practicing for a long time. If you go back to when they were early, the applications of computers were extremely limited. People said ridiculous things about how many computers you'd ever want to have. And, you know, an entire company probably went down because they never imagined people would want to own one of their own digital equipment. Uh, in a similar way, if we're really much earlier, so that we're kind of science in the 1850s or electronics in the 1850s, then many of the people were doing that because it was cool and it was fun. And they weren't quite sure what was going to happen, but boy, oh boy, you know, these electrons were neat. Yeah, I just have a quick question about, I guess, the rules. Um, you know, in this competition, is it going to all have to be rational design? Because you could equally imagine you come up with some, maybe I want some really sophisticated combinatorial logic, and then you just make a whole library of different cis regulatory regions and then select. There you go. Is that a winner or is it not? So I think the constraint's going to be, it has to be cool, number one. It's got to use parts. And then everything else is open. So I have a question for the audience. Okay. So this is the 2004 competition. If we hold a 2005 competition, are there any representatives of schools or friends of schools that might like to be involved? There's a few. Okay. <laughs> Do you have money? I mean, no. <laughs> so if you're interested in it, you know, I'm going to start collecting the list. I might do it in the order in which people request or in some other order. So send me some email. Uh, otherwise, uh, 
Just again, on this, without the theme, hammering it one more time, if you're going to not do the LC model of putting ethics once you're done, uh, or next year they're going to be at, at least 15 minutes somewhere in the two weeks or 10 weeks about some of these other issues? We, we actually have been doing in the IAP class, and we'll certainly do it in the summer competition, we spent one of our, our class periods specifically on, on the risks and those issues. And Drew always makes sure that we pay attention to that. So, okay. so d while you're getting the microphone, the, uh, when we break for lunch, the uh, members of these five teams that are here are going to get together for lunch. Uh, we'll try to find a place. There's a, there are some classrooms right at the end of the hall where the posters were. I think we'll try to go there. Okay. Um, along the lines of uh, Drew and, and Michael's comments, I wonder if in future competitions the uh, the criterion for the system you're building could be to, to answer more of a biological question like build a system that can achieve adaptation uh, mm -hmm. or, or if that could be one of the judging criteria like what's the most interesting new piece of biology that you learned from building this. Yeah. Okay. Carly, wanna... We have one last little bit here. Electioneering. Electioneering, yeah. And otherwise, thanks to the panel and uh, good luck. Thanks, guys. This is great. So uh, I'd just like to uh, run through a couple things that uh, came up in discussions about how to, uh, we might set up a committee. Uh, Samantha did a, a great job in uh, talking with people and getting advice on this. The proposal as it uh, stands at the moment is that we look at three different scenarios. So I'm just going to propose that we consider three things at the moment vote on those and go from there, particularly go to lunch. The first proposal would be that we um, decide to have Drew in charge of setting up a group of people, soliciting comments on who should be in that uh, group, et cetera, that, he, that, that our vote, if you vote for uh, plan one, Drew is responsible for setting up a group collecting input on who should be that in that group, you know, getting comments from them, getting comments from other people, just sort of proceeding along the lines he had suggested yesterday, but with a more sort of formal charge from us to really uh, take responsibility for this and get back to us at the next meeting. No. Is it? Okay. <laughs> the uh, second scenario is that we uh, vote uh, after lunch on a list of uh, candidates and there was a great uh, <laughs> good point <laughs> thanks a lot so uh, there were some other uh, great suggestions on uh, candidates who could do an excellent job on this committee uh, people uh, representing different viewpoints different stages in their careers in some cases um, and uh, some of those names are here if so plan two is we take this list and we vote after lunch on this list if we go with plan two this list will be updated over the next few minutes so if if plan two wins uh we'll be down here to get cross names off this list if you don't want to if your name's there and you don't want to serve or to add names uh if uh you want to be considered for this plan three considers any other possible course of action. <laughs> so, again, one, Drew is in charge. Two, we vote on the committee. Three, we do something else. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to vote. So, this is, this is a, a group to uh, consider, so there was a, a discussion of uh, concerns that one might have over the last, you know, at some of the earlier meetings here. The question is, in part, you know, do we think any of those are realistic? Do we think some of those are serious or not? And the proposal is to have some people 
uh, who are just thinking about that and collecting input and ideas from everyone. So I would like to do a rough count, just make up your mind, one, two, or whatever else, three. So make up your mind, we'll do a rough count, we'll just sort of see if it's a clear uh, call among these three possibilities. If it's not, I'm going to ask the rightmost person in each row to count their row, some students to serve as summators over in the right aisle, and we'll uh, get a more detailed vote. Scenario number one. Scenario number two. Scenario number three. So what's the call from the student committee here? So what's the call from the front of the room? Number one looked, uh, what, about 75% or something? I think it won. Thanks a lot, Drew. Is that how the last election went down? Yeah. Say that uh, uh, this has been probably the best meeting I've ever been to, and uh, as you can probably guess, I've been to a lot of meetings. Uh, it really is a fantastic community whose time has come, even though we're just co-opting uh, stuff that was already out there in a certain sense. Anyway, so uh, partly because two of the speakers have spoken, two of the panel members have spoken here, and, uh, and one panel member couldn't make it, um, I'm going to give, uh, and also in order to sort of kind of cap off this meeting, not to summarize it, but to try to rally us together to go out and do something specific, I've heard as kind of a, a refrain through the meeting is uh, that we need to have uh, very clear goals. And I certainly know that from having helped start the Genome Project, that one of the key things was having uh, a uh, realizable and simply stated goal, which was much less than curing cancer, by the way. OK, it was just sequencing a human genome. Anyway, uh, just like I th Fred Blattner mentioned, I have some conflicts of interest here. Uh, but fortunately, there's so many of them that they kind of cancel out. And uh, and so we somebody mentioned some uh, non-metric uh, level of viewpoint, uh, but here is actual a project that uh, uh, to uh, to get us off the planet for a couple of order of magnitude less uh, money than current uh, methods, and it's based on carbon nanotubes. And uh, the uh, part of what I want to inspire us to do during this session is to drill down to specifics on all on many of the really bold. Uh, ideas that we have out there. And this is not quite as specific as I'd like to get in a few moments, but basically that huge task of putting something, uh, putting a molecule from here to 100 kilometers can be broken down into fusing together two little one nanometer molecules. And I think this, is, this may not look like a synthetic biology task to everybody here, but uh, it's one of my favorite ones to dream about uh, because we already have uses of fullerenes for getting uh, uh, carbon nanotubes for getting bioactive peptides across membranes. And there's a lot of peptide nanotube interaction. Just briefly, someone mentioned uh, this uh, case to, as an introduction to, to the topic of drilling down to the very specifics on safety. Um, we, even if we don't have bioterrorists and, and teenage biohackers, we will create things which do not have the properties we thought they would. <laughs> Uh, even if we're making modules, which these guys were definitely, I think, using modules, IL-4 and mousepox could arguably fit into the modular way of thinking. And, uh, and they created something which even if you're genetic resistant and even if you're recently immunized, you've got a problem with this new um, um, bug. So what are the specific technical approaches we can take to safety? I mean, I think we, Roger very nicely set this up in his pre-discussion pre, uh, of this. Like, show me the path. What are the possible benefits? What activities do we do and do not do? I think we have to stop being agnostic. We have to pick something very specific. And I like the idea of having a license to practice in this field, like a pilot. I think that's not too intrusive. Um, 
I think we should admit that synthetic biology is more dangerous than nuclear technology. It's nice to have a happy face in the front of the safety committee, um, but I think we should admit that it's more risky than computer hacking, which is just a trillion dollars a year or so. And uh, we probably will not be self-regulated for much longer. And so we should really set it up to how we want to be regulated. We should put in practical uh, examples of demonstrations of how that can be done without too much bureaucracy. So we have all kinds of models for various bureaucratic things, regulate recombinant DNA and so forth. But we have an opportunity here where there really are very few, if any, um, uh, teenage garage biohackers, um, just like there are very few teenage fusion, you know, bomb creators. And, uh, and the, many of the things are, are fairly more easy to regulate than you might imagine. Um, phosphoramides and even synthetic oligonucleotides are actually fairly hard to, to do without some participation in the community. And I, so I think that as a specific thing that we can do is to encourage the open source biology, which I think really is very evident in this, this audience, um, because it brings together communities of researchers and we're, to some extent, we share complex machines. So even though uh, my group and others develop simple methods which really high school students have used uh, in the Seattle area to do sequencing, in practice almost nobody would, it's not cost effective to use anything less expensive than a $400,000 device. And the same thing is even more true for oligonucleotides. You probably can't even name the name of a cost effective oligonucleotide synthesizing machine. All, almost everybody here sends their stuff off to a company that has some proprietary machine. You don't even know its part number. Right? So I think that that can be regulated. Um, it's a small group right now. Not to summarize, but to inspire us here, what I've, I've heard some things that inspired me as specific applications and basic enabling technologies. We, were, we had a little discussion about whether uh, basic enabling technologies were toys or not. I think, in general, the ones here are, are very, very close to uh, being enabling technologies. High fidelity, E. coli that has less transposon problems that Fred mentioned, alternative codons that Peter Schultz's group has been working on a long time, uh, John mentioning uh, doing this on a whole scale basis on E. coli, uh, and so on. And then specific things like ways of breaking up biofilms, ways of getting fermentation induction to happen automatically. Uh, cost-effective drugs for uh, underdeveloped countries that Jay Kiesling mentioned, and so on. These are inspiring, and I think that we shouldn't say we don't know what this field can produce. I've heard that at least 10 times in this meeting in the sessions, not, not mentioned outside, and I think we should just stop doing that. I think that's, that's equivalent to how we shot ourselves in the foot with the Genome Project by saying it was going to be done by mindless technicians. You don't want that from a PR standpoint. I mean, the Genome Project survived it, and we will survive it, too. So you crank this up a notch, and you start getting into trouble of hyperbole. So Richard Nixon hyperbolically declared war on cancer in 1971. Renato Del Becco redeclared war on it in 1986 with the awesome power of the human genome, which did not deliver a cure for cancer, as far as I know. And, uh, but this group is much closer to it. But I don't think we necessarily have to promise something like that. Uh, we can promise big things like engineering, photosynthesis, and blah, blah. OK. But really, what the Genome Project delivered was the ability to sequence any genome or transcriptome. That was what we delivered. And that's what we should have promised to deliver. I don't know whether we would have uh, gotten the money. Who knows? But anyway, uh, the Synthetic Biology Project can deliver such things as, the ability, sort of symmetrically related to that, the ability to synthesize any genome, any protein, or any cell. By, by that, I mean usually some variation on genomes, proteins, and cells we've seen before, not necessarily one that's done completely de novo. As part of the discussion we're going to have on this panel is various ways to go. We've already talked about design and evolve digital and analog. I think the answer is it's not design versus evolution, it's design and evolution using them together. And same thing with uh, discrete parts versus uh, a manufacturing of uh, very large scale integrated circuits, sort of it epitomized down here, or, or uh, typesetting by uh, having each little block, something that you pull out of your minus 80 freezer, 
or as opposed to having something that's in a, in a uh, kind of a real-time printing operation. So I'm going to talk about a step towards the real-time printing operation, and Peter Carr will, will, uh, and others will amplify on s some of the aspects of that uh, in just a moment. So we, uh, th this meeting needs no, I've already just introduced why we want synthetic genomes, proteomes, and cells. Uh, and towards this end, we're, we're, we're tr we're, uh, tr we uh, felt that it was important to get a hold of protein synthesis, which is basically now almost completely purified, basically it's made up of entirely purified components, and there are about 150 genes involved in that. Nearly all the three-dimensional structures were known. We were heard earlier whether that should be part of the parts list. So most in, vi most in vitro translation kits are actually crude lysates from E. coli, but there is a pure translation system, uh, which was developed by Shimizu et al. Uh, in 2001, and it was actually a big community effort, and it's been used for such, and uh, <clears throat> things like it have been used for uh, ribosome display, which is a very powerful method, kind of this little icon here, where you can actually do selections for um, uh, binding or even enzymatic activity of, of, of uh, nascent polypeptide chains that are still bound to the messenger RNA via the ribosome and then do selection. So Pim Stimmer would be very happy uh, with this sort of method. And so we have, uh, and you can make peptidomabidics. You're not restricted to true proteins. And what you do is by removing the tRNA synthetases, the RNases and proteases that are present in crude lysate, you get a huge leverage there. And it's much easier to read develop codons when you're doing this in, in vitro. And so Tony Forrester, who's part of our project on this, and his colleagues have uh, developed four alternative codons. Normally these are the stop codons, but these are actually using normally coding cod codons and changing them from asparagine, threonine, and valine into other things uh, designated here, unnatural amino acids. But the system is not perfect, especially for unnatural amino acids. It's, there's room for optimization, and what we want to do is evolve it in vitro especially your in vitro conditions, if you want to express in the presence of detergent, slightly different temperature or heat or uh, redox conditions that are different from the cell where it evolved, then there's opportunity for evolving this entire system. In addition to unnatural amino acids, which Tony Forrester and others have incorporated, uh, there's the opportunity for actually getting mirror image copies of everything, which greatly expands your, your uh, your universe of proteins without having to do de novo design. You can go out and do biomining, not just through people's freezers, but through uh, the biosphere. And there are ways, for example, this uh, paper illustrates one of the uh, steps towards incorporating D-amino acids onto uh, ribosomes, uh, currently existing ribosomes. And so you can get basically have a transition state between a, a current world and a mirror world. So we've now synthesized oligonucleotides for all of the genes of a, of a genome, which we just recently got accepted for publication. We did the genome, the proteome, and the synthesis of the genome uh, all more or less simultaneously. And uh, we also are doing these 150 genes which are uh, responsible for uh, all the aspects of protein synthesis. Tony Forrester and I designed most of this and uh, a larger group of collaborators has been involved in actually doing the um, oligonucleotide arrays. So the, so the idea here is that there are a number of different ways, about uh, four or five different ways, of generating custom oligonucleotide arrays. And these, uh, such as photogenerated acids or methods like the affymetrics method, but, but now instead of requiring fixed mass, you have these... Uh, these digital uh, micro mirrors, so you have megapixels of these little mirrors that cast light in a pattern that you want, so you give it the A, the C, G, T, and just keep piling up uh, more synthesis. So these kind of high density arrays uh, was the starting point for uh, improving the costs of raw oligonucleotides. So this chip will make 18 megabases of uh, double stranded sequence in principle, uh, there's enough oligos to do that with no gaps uh, for about $700. So you can think of that as 6,000 parts 
in the parts list that we were talking about earlier this morning. So this is considerably less expensive. We won't know exactly how much less expensive it is until we have a production pipeline. But the real problem with it, the reason that everybody isn't doing it already, is the very small number of molecules you get when you get the high density chips. So uh, the answer, it, one answer, well, first of all, the biomolecular kinetics is considerably slower uh, because there's a, you goes, goes, the, goes down with the square of the concentrate, or goes up with the square of the concentration. So you really want to make sure that your concentration of your oligonucleotides is high enough. So when you take it off the chip, you either want to keep it in a small volume or amplify. We ultimately want to do this all in microfluidics, and maybe Peter will uh, uh, discuss something along those lines. But uh, for, as an early milestone, we decided to, to just do it in a large pool. So we, where target is to construct the genomic pieces from 50 MERS. In order to do that, we have to amplify, so we put 10 MERS on the ends. These amplify up with 20 MER primers, these blue primers, into 90 MERS. And then we clip off with restriction enzyme cleanly at the edges here, uh, type 2S restriction enzyme. That leaves us with 50 MERS. These 50 MERS have a few errors in them, uh, about uh, on the order of 1 in 160 in this, these particular syntheses. So we wanted to simultaneously get, just take the top strand, which is the strand we want, and to clean up the errors. Um, so in order to do that, on the same chip, or on altered chips, we also make a bunch of 26 MERS by the same, similar kind of method. Um, but now their pre-CR primers are biethylated, so now those so-called selection oligos can be used to solid phase select just the one strand of the, uh, of the 50 MER that you want. So here's the selection oligos, two of them, a left one and a right one. Uh, and they will buy, so you'll have some 90, some 90 MERS cut down into 50 MERS, so you'll have all this stuff in the mix. Some will be mismatches uh, because they'll, that is to say, they'll have an error in, in synthesis, and they will mismatch when they melt and hybridize again to another uh, sequence that's complementary to it. And some will be perfect. And those, what we want is the top strand of the perfect ones. So those will bind, only those will bind and not elute at low temperature and yes elute at high temperature. And so you end up selecting for just the 50 MERS you want with a great enrichment for those that had not had errors. Now, um, there are other methods in the, in the literature for improving error rates, either for PCR or for, for synthetic oligonucleotides. Um, here's one from John Mulligan uh, on his uh, patent, and here's one based on MUTE-S, and here's one based on the whole MUTE-HLS, which I don't have time to go into, but it, but it basically cleaves at GT, GATC sites near the mismatches. And these have been, the top one has been used to get error rates down from 6 times 10 to the minus 6 to 6 times 10 to the minus 7. That's the sort of direction that we're going in. We would like to get the error rates we get from synthetic DNA to be around 6 times 10 to the minus 7th um, so that we can uh, make larger assemblies without sequencing. For some purposes, we will want some mutations, but for many of them, we, we want to have the error rate down around 10 to the minus 7. So when we assemble, uh, I think uh, most, many of you will find this familiar, Basically, you make a staggered set. These can, these can have little gaps in between them. You, know, you have about half of the oligonucleotide overlapping. And the gaps uh, can be filled in by polymerase. Uh, ligation uh, uh, has problems, which we won't go into. Uh, and the challenges are, are repeats, um, mutation rates, and assembling very large molecules. Uh, we have efforts to get uh, automated homologous recombination, which is still in a, uh, getting close. And uh, this sort of assembly was based on Pim Stimmer's 1995 paper, and Tom Brennan is here, who is a co-author on that as well. So we've now uh, synthesized uh, all of the 30S ribosomal proteins. These are uh, out of the 150 genes that we're um, making now. And these have been made both in the wild-type version and in a completely recodon redesign for a reason that you'll see in just the next slide. And we've made them with both the Zeatron, Atactic, and Vitrogen method, 
and uh, the Nimblegen method, which are really quite different um, array-based uh, oligosynthesis methods. And here's the uh, slight improvement, or the significant improvement that we have in, uh, in accuracy. It's not, we're not at 10 to the minus 7th now yet, but we've gone from 160 uh, base pairs per error, one base pair every 160, whether you do ligation or not, to about 1 in 1400, 1400 um, with the hybridization selection method that I just described. And this is just one round of hybridization selection, none of the mute HLS tricks and so on. So I'm, uh, certainly it should be a, 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 an important goal to improve that uh, accuracy further. And this is the reason we did the code on redesign, and it shows some of the power of, of, re, of doing gene synthesis from, from scratch. Um, part of the thing I'd like to bring out in this panel is uh, it, exactly where is the, actually Drew has encouraged me to do this, where is the crossover where we will all switch over to just synthesizing genes rather, uh, where's the crossover in terms of cost, where we'll switch over to synthesizing genes rather than constructing them from PCR products, from genomes and transcriptomes. Uh, so the reason that we redesigned the codons were that many of these were undetectable with our most sensitive Western blots. So for example, the wild type version of ribosome protein 20 was missing, and then after codon optimization, you can see right next to it, it's a nice healthy band. And even those that were detectable were all improved by uh, codon optimization. And I should emphasize that these, were all, these are all great codon usage genes. The ribosomal proteins are among the best in the, in the uh, land. But they're, uh, they're, uh, the in vitro systems, as I alluded to before, are not necessarily optimized to do, uh, they're optimized for in vivo, and you've made them do these strange things with odd combinations like T7, RNA polymerase, and uh, E. coli ribosomes. So kind of segging into the, uh, Peter's slides and some panel discussion, uh, we're interested in enabling technologies. We need to be proud of the ones that we've already uh, done. We need to be proud of the ones that where there are actual, uh, you know, uh, applications of those enabling technologies. We've talked about multi-gene assembly, and I've shown protein and peptid and mimetic syntheses, um, both this morning and in mine. Uh, we alluded to computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing for this field. Uh, what we haven't talked about too much is automated homologous recombination, both for E. coli and uh, yeast and embryonic stem cells, which I think should be a very high priority. And uh, fidelity enhancements. Fred Blattner has his strains so that they don't transpose much, but then there's the opportunity for eliminate, reducing point mutations. That came up in this morning's session about the stability of constructs. And uh, and sequencing, we need to do quality control on these things. Even if we reduce the error rate to a reasonable level, it's still want to know what your parts are. And fortunately, the NIH is already funding efforts to get the cost of human genomes down to $1,000 each, which is, uh, I'm certainly very supportive of that. And that brings it for our community, but we'll bring it down to 10 to the seventh base pairs per dollar. I think that this will happen much faster than most people think it will happen. So I'm going to turn it over to I won't say what that is, though, right? It's, it'll be available Thursday. I won't say which, which Thursday, right? <laughs> OK. So let's, uh, number three, Peter. Uh, yes. So George was kind to let me have just a, a few moments to uh, explain to the, the general group why uh, I might be here with uh, other panelists who, who uh, need no explanation for their presence on this committee, uh, uh, panel, excuse me. Thanks uh, to the organizing committee for inviting me uh, to be on here. And the reason I'm on here is that uh, I'm another person who's very interested in de novo DNA synthesis, as, uh, as George was talking about. And we would all like to have, well, many of us would like to have the device that streamlines this entire process from design to send to printer to have in a, in a viable, useful form. Uh, and so the question is, what's the most direct route for us, uh, for us to get there? And that's what uh, the technologies that many of us are pursuing, and, uh, including myself and uh, others at the MIT Media Lab. And, uh, of course, now there's an argument uh, that uh, you may not want everybody to be able to have this on their bench next to their PCR thermocycler, although many of us would love to have that. Uh, that's, uh, that's certainly something this community needs to be engaged in. What is access to this sort of uh, uh, technology going to look like? 
And this is a, a great location where I don't need to explain what, uh, what the uses are, even over uh, several different orders of magnitude, if you could make any of the DNA that you wanted. Uh, and we've heard uh, several good examples about circuits and uh, genomes and mini-genomes. And just a, a re-emphasis of the, the value of being able to spit out even single genes and, uh, and single parts uh, as somebody who uh, who likes to design in the in the world of protein structure, the, the thing that I uh, would love to have is something that cuts down my iteration time. It's been uh, emphasized many times how uh, how the designs typically do not work the first time, and so what we need is something that really cuts the time, the iteration time for redesign, from uh, from weeks and months often down to uh, days, as few as few days as possible. And so, what does a process like that uh, look like? Just schematized. Originally, I envisioned, you know, everything in the box would, in this larger box here would be part of your, uh, your integrated system to spit out either a gene, a thousand genes, or a genome, depending on your particular needs. The, the goal being really to take the sort of ideas that George was just talking about and to keep as much of it on chip uh, for as long as possible so that you can uh, produce as much in parallel as, uh, as you might want to. So you start with uh, making your oligos through the assembly, different f forms of error correction, which I'm glad uh, George touched on because I won't be able to uh, elaborate here, uh, different forms of assembly and eventually to whatever you want to do with that DNA. And I, I think this component here actually, especially given advances in microfluidics in the last few years, this, uh, whether it's expression, uh, sequencing, uh, quality control, uh, and even clonal analysis and selection, all has the potential to be kept on chip to really um, show the sort of massively parallel uh, productivity that we've seen in, in genome efforts. That's really all I wanted to okay. touch on. Why don't we leave that up while we go oh. on to the other, if that's okay with you, Peter. Sure. Uh, go on to the other panelists uh, or, I, or open up the questions. Which would you I'm prefer? Opening up the slide. Open, we're opening it up the questions. <laughs> you can ask for any previous slide or just whatever you want to say. I had a question for you, George, yeah. uh, which is, uh, you know, how important the uh, the secondary structure in some of the uh, some of the mRNAs might be in terms of the expression level of these genes that you're totally resynthesizing, and whether you looked at all at the uh, at the secondary structure of those. So that that those ones that we re ribosomal protein right. genes that we reoptimized, we had the feeling that it was messenger RNA secondary structure because codons were were good. We knew there was a mismatch between the T7 polymerase and the the uh, RNA, the, the ribosome, which doesn't matter in vivo, but might matter in this in vitro system. We have not proven that what we that our improvements were via sec messenger RNA secondary structure. They all reduced AT, the GC content, um, but um, so. Uh, we're, we, we, we haven't. We, we just know they improve the, the protein production. I think that's all we've established so far. So we did do a small scale. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we did do a small scale experiment on uh, expression of proteins in an in vitro system with Roche and their particular system, and we did find that just codon optimization didn't work as well as codon optimization plus removing secondary structure. And that, that those together had a big impact of up to 500-fold with certain proteins. I just had a question about the, uh, the process engineering. So I know, John, it seems like you're implementing a lot of uh, error detection and then filtering. Uh, and then, Pete, you're proposing, you know, coming back with error correction. I presume that's what that means. So, so can you talk all, a little bit about sort of the trade-offs there in terms of the, the time? I mean, are we – would – what about the approach of just making something, sequencing it, and getting really good at multi-site site directed mutagenesis or something equivalent? Yeah, I think that's impractical for large-scale projects. I think error reduction is really a much better approach because just the numbers are, uh, I mean, if you have an error rate of one in a few hundred and you're trying to make something that's 10 kb long, you have to look at a very, very large number of molecules. Uh, I, uh, I, I think we agree that we would want initial error reduction to be uh, implemented as fully as possible, that that has the potential to be the cleanest. But at some point, that will will break down. And I think we we will need some some element that's similar to that, more or less. Um, and you can imagine possibly implementing some of those things if you can do, say, single molecule-based clonal selection. 
there's no way of keeping errors out universally. But if you can do that, for, you know, to hammer that point home again on a, on a chip, uh, and then you do your sequencing on a chip, uh, and then your site-directed mutagenesis, which is all plausible, uh, you, uh, you have an avenue to implement just what you're saying. I think it's something that we still have to evaluate. I'd, I'd like to see it tried. We got a question up here. I have a question for George. Uh, it, it's known that uh, no, quite a number of the ribosomal proteins inhibit their own synthesis by binding to the mRNA, so it kind of balances the stoichiometry as they get made. I'm wondering if there's any correlation between that and your sets. Yeah, actually, uh, let's see. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, uh, 1, 7, 8, and 20 autoregulate. And so 20 is one of the ones that was down. But it was so far down uh, that it, that may or may not be it. We do engineer out some of the uh, self-regulating sites as we uh, uh, improve the secondary structure. Or as we think we improve the secondary structure. Yep. And we may want to put that back in at some point. But right now it's in our way. One of the things I wanted to bring up is the, uh, I guess, obvious point, which I think, you know, uh, was made before, which is that uh, enabling this technology is great, but, uh, you know, but, and, and I think we're all enthusiastic about the application space that that brings forward, but uh, there's also a set of huge dangers that come with that. And uh, I guess about five years ago, I got pretty concerned about that, and uh, I did a simple sort of thought experiment in our lab. Uh, we run a... Uh, uh, we we're, were back in the old days, George. We, we run a 394 synthesizer in the lab. So we actually make our own oligos. And uh, what I did is I, I collected the oligos that we had synthesized over the past, uh, you know, two or three months. And uh, I, I decided to try the experiment. And, you know, it, it wasn't double blind, so the, there's a problem with that in that I know, knew what we were doing. But uh, I, I took that. Uh, you know the set of oligos as a uh, as an input and tried to pretend at least that I didn't know what we were doing that uh, that we would uh, you know look at those oligos and say you know can we determine what this laboratory is working on looking just at the oligos that had been synthesized and the answer is yes absolutely you can it's there you know you know there's no question that you can figure that out and uh, so that's encouraging in some respects. Uh, you can look at the bits. There's, a, there's sort of a choke point in the laboratory, the transition between the bits that are flowing into the synthesizers and the uh, output of that synthesizer, where if you were able to actually look at what those bits are, uh, you know, there's an, enough of those bits and they tell you enough about what's being done to be able to establish what's going on in the laboratory. And, uh, you know, so there is an opportunity here, I think, uh, to treat this, uh, some of these, uh, you know, some of these security issues as a, you know, as a, as a computer science issue. And, uh, you know, by controlling some of the resources, which uh, I, I think George was talking about earlier, uh, some of the chemistry is pretty exotic. Uh, you know, the phosphoramidite chemistry, uh, in some respects, is similar to some of the uh, chemical weapons, uh, you know, technologies. It's, it's pretty exotic chemistry. Uh, I think we could imagine a time when, when you could control some of that. I think that would require international cooperation since the sources of most of the phosphoramidites are way outside. In Germany specifically. Well, China is also and a China, source. For, right. And North but, Co Korea is a source. But it seems like the sort of thing we could ask for if we wanted that to be. Because it, that kind of chokehold might be more palatable than chokes on information flow, or on grants or whatever There's other also. things that the regulators will dream up, and believe me, they will. Yeah. There's also, just to be practical, there's a big used market in oligosynthesizers, and actually oligosynthesizer design is very straightforward. Uh, so but the chemistry is not. Right. The, that, well, that would be a good experiment to, to do, uh, the one where you're saying if you, if you went into a lab and not knowing what they did, could you, uh, could you tell what they're doing? So there was actually a big uh, controversy in the oligosynthesis world a few years ago where one of the oligosynthesis providers was rumored to be mining their uh, order flow for data, and that caused all the pharma companies to stop ordering from that group. So 
Uh, it, it, there is some precedent for this idea. Right back there. Yes, uh, the question I have for the panel uh, has to do with uh, cost and also speed for DNA synthesis. So I, I'd uh, be interested to hear exactly where things are now and how the panel foresees that evolving in the next few years. As far as cost per base now, I, I understand it's in the 2 to $3 per base range. Where is that going and also having to do with speed? How long will it take to synthesize a 3KB fragment in the next few years? And uh, how rapidly will this become a commodity? Uh, I, uh, speaking from the commercial point of view, it, it, it is a commodity already. Uh, it's, the price is going down very rapidly. Uh, the commercial price that you can find on the web today ranges from uh, under $2 to the $3 range. Uh, delivery times are typically a few weeks for shorter fragments, and that's coming down rapidly as well. And so I think the, it's clear that the prices are going down. It is a commodity. It's, the technology used to produce it is not particularly relevant to the end product, and so uh, it's a perfect, and there's no dominating patents in the area, so it's a perfect area to be commoditized. Uh, the things that are pushing the price down are new entrants into the field, primarily. There's not, uh, the biggest users of gene synthesis technology are today in the biotech and pharma companies. And there's not a lot of price pressure from there. The pressure from there is primarily on delivery time. Um, so uh, George made the, uh, the parallel to the Human Genome Project. And uh, in terms of deliverables for this field, um, one reasonable deliverable could be um, the ability to synthesize genomes, et cetera. So do you, do you uh, feel that in, in the sense uh, with genome projects that there were certain genomes as the human genome that were sequenced, uh, should we propose to, to assemble a particular genome and then um, and possibly as that, that, or, that uh, effort was organized, organize it as a group effort uh, and assemble the genome? And if so, uh, which genome? I just wonder what uh, George and others think about uh, that sort of an effort. Let me paraphrase it and partially answer it before I turn it over to the other pa panelists. My understanding of this question is, which genome? Same question that we asked in the Human Genome Project. And uh, I, mean, I think we've heard, I, mean, I think it's going to follow the same path. It's going to be a lot of genomes. And you don't necessarily have to get com complete community commitment to one. Uh, clearly, there's some momentum on E. coli that Fred Blattner described in his talk. Um, and and uh, clearly many of the participants in this community are already heavily using that. So if you could set a set of goals for resynthesizing E. coli, it would really make it, or mesoplasma forum, I'm sorry, and, you know, a pair of uh, genomes that, that are usable in this community, that would be something that we could set as a milestone. And I wouldn't think that it would be just synthesizing at once. It would be synthesizing many variations on it. Some may be just trivial homologous recombinations. Some may be just new plasmids. Some will be complete rewrites, but still having the framework and maybe using homologous recombination to achieve the goal fairly early on. But you want to make it an achievable goal, something that we can do um, in the next few years. I think it is an achievable goal in a few years, but I don't think that it's I mean, I think what's interesting about synthetic biology isn't creating new genomes. It's the levels of abstraction we're talking about, the idea of design. And so it's, what's much more interesting is what are you going to do with it and what are the, what's the process. I think that making, this, uh, making a genome an intermediary goal is an interesting potential idea. And I think it's I, obviously it's something I think is a really interesting idea to do, but it's not the goal of synthetic biology. I think there's a point that uh, that you know that hasn't been brought up, which is the importance of getting faster at this technology. Uh, my sense is that biology is uh, still somewhat in the uh, uh, the dignified uh, you know, style of the uh, of the English countryside. Uh, you know, the the uh, <clears throat> the practitioners go into the lab, and and when it works, great. Um, and if it doesn't, you go and, and you know you come back the next day, and it's okay if it takes you know a month or two months or five years to have something happen. Uh, I think we have an opportunity, and I, I don't know whether we'll capitalize on it, we have an opportunity to take that stately pace and accelerate it a lot. 
and uh, you know the uh, some of the tools we're talking about are going to make it possible to do things much more rapidly than anyone has any uh, experience with and there's both power and danger there uh, but uh, I'd, I'd like to think that the power is going to be uh, you know outweigh the powerful you know, uses of that technology are, are going to outweigh the dangers but uh, the speed with which we can do things is inherently also going to change the way that, that we think about and, and do the science. And it's the speed of the whole process. It's the design, the synthesis, and the testing, and, and it's not uh, it's the, the whole, it's the cycle time. Right. In computers, you know, of course, uh, you know, there's this you know, thing that doesn't really get talked about as much as it once did, which is the speed of the edit, debug, compile loop. How fast can you uh, edit your program, you know, compile it, test it out, see whether it works or not, and go back and, and make the changes that are necessary. And, uh, you know, in biology, that, that loop has been, you know, had, you know, month-long or maybe in many cases year-long, uh, you know, sort of uh, extent. And if we can change that so that it's uh, a day or ten minutes or, uh, you know, even shorter than that, uh, then we are, are going to accelerate the rate at which things happen. So um, just put a number or two on the 3 KB example that was raised in an earlier question. Indeed, making the oligos and assembling them, that can be a one-day process, that everything else can, can, the, can add up quite a bit more. The, in particular, you correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, that uh, the quality control, getting it into cells and sequencing for quality control are probably more time-consuming than that, than that first step. So, but if you get your errors to a point where you're very confident that your 3KB construct has a minimal number of errors, you may be able to use it out of the box uh, before you go ahead and do some of that sequencing. That's a potential if you're, if you're confident in, in the error level of your process. Mm, I, I had two questions. One first for Tom. Um, you were saying that it was, it, when you did a quick little experiment, you were able to tell pretty much with, with great facility how how, how, what someone was working on the lab by looking at their algo sequences. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it be pretty easy to um, do something like steganography with your algo sequences if you really were, in, if you really had bad intentions and pretty much um, obscure what you were doing unless someone was really looking for you to do that? And that, wouldn't that be a great danger? That's, that's one, and I had a question for George, which was just a more biological question, which is what is the state of the art of this automated homologous recombination in any of these systems, like say embryonal stem cell system or anything like that. Um, so the steganography one to take that first. Uh, I, I do think if you were intent, you probably could obfuscate things. Uh, but you know, our experience in in computer viruses and so forth is that people are pretty sloppy about that. They don't they don't do a good job of covering their tracks. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot of information here. I mean, a 20-base oligo has 40 bits in it. That's, you know, that's a lot of bits. And, uh, you know, if you're ordering 100 of them in order to make a gene, then, you know, that's really a lot of bits. Uh, you're going to know a lot about what somebody's trying to do with that kind of information. Let me answer the second half of your question about automated homologous recombination. There are very few efforts that I know of, certainly, that are announced efforts. Uh, we have a, you know, fairly low level effort with that uh, uh, we've been distributing plasmas for homologous recombination in the past, and we've developed a variation on the court method for, for E. coli, which is, uh, has a strong enough positive and negative selection that you can basically go through liquid cultures without picking colonies. So that's, a, that's very close, I would say. Uh, I think that getting that fully automated and high fidelity and, and so forth, we're doing all sorts of fidelity tests, which has also been fairly rare in this, in this field of, of homologous recombination. And I think extending that to uh, mouse embryonic stem cells should be uh, the next goal. And I, I would like to see an NIH RFA or, or at least somebody stepping forward with funds they already have available. That would be great. I mean, this is probably to Tom regarding security again. <clears throat> I would say we're getting to the stage when high school student with a credit card can you know, build tomorrow, more or less, okay, a SARS with cholera toxin or whatever. 
And with two or four primers, which nobody will obviously recognize because it's out there, you know, in the sea of primers. And I really don't see any way to prevent this from happening. Okay. <laughs> I, well, I think one thing that will slow it down is that there's a lot of easier ways to get pathogens. I think that we should worry about things that are, uh, if there's an easier way to get to the same answer, I wouldn't worry about getting to it by synthetic biology. You want anthrax? Go and get anthrax out of the soil. You want a SARS, you know, or you want a, uh, other pathogens. You can certainly, a, a good virologist can think of easier ways to get the pathogen you want than ordering it. I don't think we're worried as much about the good. I'm, I'm not sure a virologist could do that much better than this thing here, which mm -hmm. does require a little bit of construction, you know. Right, the IL-4 scheme. Yeah. That, I mean, it does require some construction, but it's not. Um, Roger. I don't want to be sharp here, but I, I actually, John, I, I, it's true that it's easier to get hold of anthrax than it is to synthesize anthrax. Right. It's Spire not easier about. to get hold of polio than it is for many of the people right. in this room to resynthesize polio. Soon it will be not easier for them to get hold of SARS by getting hold of SARS than it will be for them to resynthesize SARS. Uh, so I, I think for the short viral genomes, the, the future is here. It's certainly straightforward with current technology to build SARS size genomes. Uh, but if you wanted to make a novel coronavirus, that would have nastier characteristics than SARS, uh, yes, you could do it by constructing it and engineering it with a particular model, the IL-4 model, but there's lots of other much more low-tech ways you could do it. Uh, you know, set, anyway, I, I, I don't want to... put a toxin on the existing SARS? I mean, yep, you know, suppose I, I you're... Know, I think that's the easiest way for me to do it. I don't know of a lower-tech way to do it than by building a toxin gene in. Uh, I'm not sure I want to describe a lower tech way of doing it, but I can sure think of lower tech ways of doing it. I mean, is it appropriate to, you know, give out recipes for easy ways to... No, I don't think we should be in that business, quite frankly, uh, yeah. Other than the ones that have hit the literature already. Right. Yeah, we can, we can undermine those, but here, Eric. Yeah, so it's a question for, maybe for all of you, but I'll primarily aim it at Tom first. The speeding up the capabilities so to rapid response time is a, is a, is a terrific goal and a, a terrific way to capture just one small thing that emerges from this field. I'm, I'm wondering if it's possible to be quantitative about it though. I mean qualitatively we all have a feeling for what that means but could, has one ever or could one ever capture the numbers, you know, how, you know, I know when, it, when I visit labs and you know how slow it goes with your own graduate students, just, do, just slogging away in this old-fashioned way. But has that been captured somewhere in terms of, you know, here's the time it takes to do this, this simple thing. And if we could only write it and read it and assemble it and whatnot, here's how much faster it would be. And then, and there, and then the payoff would just, it would just be very obvious even to bureaucrats like me. So. Well, we heard earlier this after, we heard earlier this uh, this morning about the assembly process that we're using and uh, I've given a fair amount of thought to how we speed that process up. You know, what are what are the ways in which we could optimize that process? Uh, you know, Randy this morning said, you know, well, you know, 3 to 5 days. Uh, I really think that uh, you know, the honest number at this point probably is, you know, two days if you, if things went well. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know how to do it that fast. Uh, but we could, we could think about automating that, putting robotics on the case, uh, maybe replacing growing colonies with, uh, you know, maybe some sort of, uh, you know, um, you know templify sort of amplification of plasmids rather than growing them in cells. Uh, there's, there's a whole set of numbers that you could associate with some of the simple assemblies that we're doing uh, that, you know, are really, you know, in my uh, gun sights, as it were. Uh, so, uh, but I think it would be valuable to collect some of the data about how painful the process currently is. I, I think a lot of people don't know how 
how slow, slowly these things really go right at the moment. There, there's an anecdote that I, I don't know if Roger was at this. I think some people in here were in, at this meeting with me. It was a DARPA thing, and Lynn Edelman uh, attended. I don't. Uh, Lynn is the, is this USC mathematician. He's the A in RSA encryption. Uh, technology, and he, he, he did that toy experiment, the traveling salesman uh, 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 problem with uh, seven nodes and, and, and coding that in, in DNA. And he, So he was talking about how he now has a wet lab and comparing what his wet lab experience was like to the old days when he did pure math, you know, do, doing the math. He'd sit in his office and, and he'd write and he knew the trajectory he was on and it would all get done. And now a typical day in, in the wet lab side of his life is that a, he has a morning meeting with the graduate student looking over gels and wondering why bands are there that shouldn't have been and, 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 and so on. And then it all comes down to they had the magnesium concentration wrong and, you know, and, then, and we all know what, that, what that's like. So he, so he was asking you know, sort of plaintively, what, what would it take to, uh, to develop al an, algorithm, an algorithmic kind of biology? You know, to, where you take the graduate students out of the loop uh, for the for the you know for all the dumb parts you know for you know and not just use them as slave labor. As, uh, well, I think it's joke. robots. Right. It's uh, standardized protocols. I mean, let's get serious about the idea that that you don't design two experiments for every one that you want to do. I mean, at the moment, I mean, I think you've probably heard me say this before, but uh, you know the. The current situation is uh, if you want to clone you know, some piece of DNA into a vector, uh, the first thing you do is design the experiment, and I would you know, argue that it is an experiment that, you know, of choosing the right set of restriction enzymes and designing how these particular ends are going to you know, fold up and ligate and do the right thing. Um, you know, don't go there. Right? You should, there should be a standard process. You shouldn't have to think. There shouldn't have to be an experimental design. There shouldn't have to be an experimental analysis of whether it's going to work and why it didn't. There should just be, of course, you put it in the machine and, and the machine does it. Uh, you know, one of the things I think you just articulated, Tom, is, is engineering's and synthetic biology's gift back to biology, uh, every person from an engineering background whom I've ever spoken with has been horrified by the amount of troubleshooting and uh, ad hoc experimentation that's necessary to go from engineering point A to engineering point B. Uh, that uh, same ad hoc experimentation uh, obtains in any scientific investigation and is uh, widely kind of discounted, not moaned about by the scientific practitioners uh, who are used to taking four weeks of troubleshooting and never having that detail show up in their exactly. account of their own research uh, to their peers in a group meeting or, or much less in the published literature. By uh, doing away with that in your sphere, you can give back to the scientists whose work will go ever so much better. And you will probably not be appropriately thanked for that. Well, I mean, just in defense of biologists, uh, I think there's a rational reason why people don't spend a lot of time optimizing everything that they do. I mean, the people who do that are graduate students still working on their first restriction enzyme when they're 40, you know. Uh, biology uses today a really wide range of techniques, and so there's a culture of doing what works and not changing it if it works, because that's how you're successful in answering questions. RISB reduced instruction set biology. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, so uh, along those lines, I, I'm uh, uh, here. We had presented a poster here from a company called Modular Genetics, and uh, I just want to mention I, I feel that it's relevant that what we were seeking to do is to develop one engineering system that can be used to perform any of the four fundamental gene engineering functions. I mean, because we, when we think about gene engineering, at one level it's very, it's very complicated, and we're talking about all these restriction enzymes and the various things that are done. But in a fundamental way, there are only four things we really ever do. There's insertion, deletion, modification, and recombination. And so we've developed one system that allows us to perform all those functions in a semi-automated fashion and also seamlessly. So I think it's the kind of system, or it could at least be a component of the sort of system you're describing, where you don't have to think. I mean, that was one of the motivations, is that, that you could uh, design the assemblies and sort of go backwards to how you would create the assembly without having 
having to do a lot of thinking. Yeah, I mean, the thing about DNA is that it's it is a central piece of everything that biology does, and it is uniform. And there's, I mean, automating that part of biology is really straightforward. I mean, that's I think there's a, a lot of people here who who see that that's really valuable. And I think the scheme that you're talking about is very useful. Um, I actually had a question. Um, with regards to what Tom was saying about how you can look at oligos and, and see what people have been want to do in the lab, do you actually screen the sequences? This is directed towards John. Do you screen the sequences that you get in and look for stuff? But I mean, perhaps if, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you wouldn't want your DNA synthesis right. company so doing that. Right. So what we do, in, I mean, what we do precisely is to screen uh, all of the sequences against the select agent, a database of sequences in select agents. And so the select agents are a list maintained by the CDC of uh, agricultural and human pathogens. Uh, and we, we do that and we look at how to design the, the assembly of the gene and we really don't do anything else with the sequence. We don't make any attempt to, what we try to do is avoid doing anything illegal at this point. So while not uh, violating the confidentiality of the customers, uh, but I think one of the things that I'd like to see the field as a whole try to do is to develop algorithms for recognizing uh, novel pathogens. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's at least a feasible goal to think about how do you recognize something that might be a part of a pathogen, or how do you recognize a whole pathogen when somebody tries to design it de novo. I mean, you know, I, I was saying a minute ago that I don't, I don't think that's going to happen right away, but it's a sufficiently hard problem, so I think it's one we ought to be thinking about now before it's worthwhile doing. So, so you look for distant matches as well as close yes. matches? Yeah, and so, so basically we have an extremely sensitive filter, and then anything that comes up positive, we then search that against the whole of GenBank, and you know, most of the time it turns out to be a homolog from a non-pathogen. Uh, a significant, the rest of the time it is a perfect match to the uh, pathogen, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, the CDC rules allow you to distribute genes for select agents as long as you're not distributing uh, whole viral genomes or uh, uh, pathogenic functionality. And there are some clear, clear holes in this uh, scheme. What fraction of a virus can you use? Right. So you can, I mean, you can legally order a third of uh, coronavirus from each of three groups, and you can't legally assemble it, but they can legally send it to you. Uh, clearly, that's not something we would want to do uh, unless, I mean, we do get a, f a fair number of uh, orders for parts of pathogens. There's a lot of people who are working on vaccines, and recoding the sequence is a, uh, a really great way to improve DNA vaccines and things like that. So there's there's a lot of interest in it, and synthesis is a really good, I mean, it's an, it's an, air, uh, an approach that's effective for that because you don't have to deal with the whole organism. So there's a lot of legitimate reasons why people are uh, acquiring pieces of pathogens. But uh, we actually had a, uh, we were licensed by the CDC to distribute select agents until the changes in regulation after 911, when it just became uneconomical for us to do that. Uh, it's now, to distribute select agent genes, you now have to uh, have FBI checks on everybody who enters the lab and stuff like that. And it's just not, there's not enough demand for it to be worth complying with the regulations. But uh, it's a long answer to a short question. And be careful what you synthesize on our synthesizer. <laughs> you know, some, something just to point out is that uh, is that is that we have uh, you know the situation, funny situation right now that uh, you can order a single oligo, which is a select agent, uh, and uh, you know that's pretty scary. Uh, you know, hundred hundred base uh, sequence coding for a, a, a conotoxin. Uh, you know, is, I'm not I'm not is, convinced uh, that the oligo companies are screening for that. No, I don't think they are. I mean, it's which is a huge liability, a huge potential liability, because they can violate, you can violate the law with a single order. Are you uh, these <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I personally don't want to commit felonies as part of my business. But, uh. Tom, just for curiosity, why is it that, what's you, that you make your own oligonucleotides? Uh, it's a matter of turnaround time. 
And, uh, you know, so there's just, uh, there's just, you know, you save a day. And, uh, you know, if, if in the afternoon or, or worse yet, in the evening, uh, you are in the middle of doing something, then, you know, a couple of hours later you can go. And uh, that, you know, I, I, know, I know that doesn't fit into the stately model of biology, but, uh, but it, it, it changes things. Yeah. And uh, what fraction of the world do you think currently makes their own oligos on a 394? A very small fraction. But, uh, there's a lot of them. I think there's a lot of companies. Okay. A lot of companies do that, where they'll have a little bit of oligosynthesis in house for exactly that reason. Uh, John, what would you recommend as a strategy for for closing the loopholes that you just mentioned? I, I wish I had a great answer for that question, but. Uh, I think that some of the things that we've talked about here may have to happen. You may have to try to close the, I mean, certainly I would uh, like to see regulation, it's whether, well, probably some form of self-regulation that's also enforced by some uh, knowledgeable central authority about uh, at least the things that are on the current select agent lists. I mean, everybody who's making DNA ought to be looking to see if they're making something that it's illegal to make. You know, that seems like a fairly, you know, a basal level uh, request. Uh, and I, I think the idea of monitoring uh, synthesis is, is a good one. Uh, difficult, but a good idea. Hi, uh, I was wondering, uh, if we want to have an algorithm to detect pathogen, does that mean we, ha we will have an algorithm to design pathogen? And what if the truth is, we, we can, uh, if we want the good part of synthetic biology to human, but we can't stop the evil part of the synthetic biology? I think that's a great question, because I think the right answer isn't, I mean, part of the answer is to try to block production, you know, make it more difficult to do the evil part, but the other part of the answer is, and the only long-term effective part is to uh, be better at responding to pathogens. I mean, it doesn't, you don't need to postulate, as George Post said, you don't need to postulate terrorists. There will be new pathogens. People are a very different ecological target for pathogens than we were even a decade ago. I mean, we're a big, highly mixed population that's growing rapidly and that's touching every piece of the ecosphere. And we're... You know, we're a different, a, a kind of pathogen that a decade or two or three decades ago would have killed two or three people and died out or killed a village could now spread through the whole world before it causes, you know, before it, it becomes ineffective in its evolutionary path. Uh, uh, you know, you don't want to kill your host off too fast, and how fast you kill your host has to depend on how fast that host mixes and how many of them there are and things like that. And so I think there's a compelling uh, evolutionary and ecological reason to believe that there will be new pathogens arising. So I think that one of the goals, whether it's of synthetic biology or, or other parts of biology, has to be to respond very quickly to new pathogens. You know? And maybe bioterrorism will provide the motivation for being able to do that, but it's something that we need to do as a, as a country. I have a question for you, John, about the, the law. Uh, how far does its writ extend? I mean, aren't there places where people could set up and do business and uh, there would be no, no prohibition, no effective prohibition? Right. There are, I, I believe if you read the newspaper, there are probably parts of the world where there are no regulations at all. And, uh, uh, and there are different rules for every uh, country. I mean, we were, we talked to the CDC a couple of years ago and uh, and, and things have, have gotten a good deal better since then, but we were trying to track down how to, uh, what things that was legal to export. And, you know, it, there's a different set of rules for every country. And the, the, the regulatory agencies in each country are not even necessarily fully aware of, let alone communicating with, the regulatory agencies in the other countries. Eric, while we're waiting for Roger. Okay, so um, just to push again on the uh, the enhanced speed that might emerge from uh, the synthetic biology area, what 
What part of a national response to a bad version of SARS or say the next flu pandemic, which a lot of people think is inevitable, is uh, spectacularly enabled and speeded up by the kind of technology that George and others have been talking about. I mean, there, 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 are multiple, right, there are multiple ways in which a country responds to a pandemic, and some of that involves, the, is, is biotech, that's, that synthetic biology um, uh, would participate in. But how, how much of it is, is biotech? Well, so here's one idea that, for example, has plenty of flaws, but uh, consider the case of distributed, you know, broadly distributed vaccine production. Let's now, for the most part, if you have a rapid response that allows you to try for a vaccine for a, for a new pathogen as it comes out, let's say it's a very rapidly spreading pathogen that's destroying infrastructure, a very bad case. Uh, maybe some of your infrastructure is destroyed, which would allow you to respond by the time a, a vaccine is discovered. But if you have widely distributed uh, ability to make genes and therefore proteins that might be necessary for a vaccine. It's just could, an idea. You could also imagine, and I, I think we've talked to some, some people down at the CDC about this, uh, enabling the uh, selection of, of uh, you know, antigenic regions of, uh, of, of proteins, uh, assembling those into uh, perhaps a single protein, which you know, in pure form could be used as a, as a vaccine. I think all the ideas for doing this are out there, and there are companies probably and, and organizations doing every piece you need. It's a matter more of, uh, you know, there's people who are working on vaccine design. There are people who are working on, there's, you know, you have synthesis. You have the ability to detect pathogens, probably by large-scale sequencing. Uh, it's a matter of pulling together those pieces into a, a structure that can respond, a robust structure. Yep. It's not going to be destroyed by the problem. Uh, and I think it takes, it takes a group of people thinking about how to do it and then uh, implementing it and testing it. So try it every year. You know, yeah. set up a group and say, you know, at some randomly chosen yep. moment, say, okay, here's a virus or here's, here's a sample. I want uh, 100 million doses of vaccine for that sample in three months. And you do that every year or two. And if you do that right, then, you know, science comes out of that as well as, as, well as uh, you know, experience on the part of the team. Well, to continue that, that thread, uh, yeah. you know, as you said, John, synthetic DNA, DNA touches all aspects of it. So one place that agile um, um, synthetic DNA would touch that's relevant to this story, it's another, it's another piece in a, in a capability is, uh, and, and this is something you and I have discussed, Eric, is, um, you, you want to move fast to be able to make um, some kind of antibody derivative against proteins on this thing. Okay, and now you've got it. You've got some single-chain antibody or something like that. And you want to tell Paul Godowski at Genentech uh, to w remake that into a human antibody. So he's going to move as fast as he can to a kilogram of human IgG. That will buy prophylaxis. I'm calling it PGP, pretty good prophylaxis, for a million people passive immunity. So how fast you can get to that first kilogram of recombinant right. human antibody makes a difference. So the first synthetic, the first DNA construct should be synthetic. It should be codon optimized. It should have no secondary structure that we think will be bad. The very first construction and should be right. And that will save two <laughs> days right. in a time when two days is worth something. trouble, you know, with, with, you know, I already know who's made what vaccine, uh, so I'll put out a hundred of them, or a thousand of them. It, you, you can't stop it that way. Well, I think postulating a terrorist that's making one virus is hard enough, let alone uh, somebody who's making well, a thousand different I mean, ones. And likewise, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, all this thing about, you know, it, DNA is tough to make, it isn't. And you know that too, John. Right. And and uh, you know, if I was a terrorist, what I or, and, and I knew that there was the CDC was watching, would I order your gene from you? No, I would build my own gene machine, and that's going to happen in the next few years too. Yeah, I mean, I think that just argues for being qu being able to respond quickly. I mean, the, the good guys have to be. I mean, the the big advantage is that uh, 
99.999% of the people who could do this wouldn't, or 99.9999% of them are not going to do it. So you've got a numerical advantage. And you also have a huge advantage in terms of resources. And so the hope is that your 10,000-fold numerical advantage and 10,000-fold economic advantage is enough to beat. Uh, the other, the other comment to make is that, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but uh, a lot of these people are stupid. Uh, you know, the, the, yeah, fact, the fact that, uh, that, that they could be detected this way is not something they think about. Uh, the fact that, I mean, the fact is, if you look in the computer virus world, uh, there's absolutely nothing that stops a similar sort of comment to be made with computer viruses, but in fact, it doesn't happen. I mean, I think computer viruses are a great example. It's something where there's lots of computer viruses, but there's a lot, you could certainly, clever people, because clever people in this room could make a computer virus that's better than anything that's ever been released, yeah, that's, that's more destructive. Microsoft, not because, and, and the biologists aren't anywhere near that centralized. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of worried we're kind of hijacking this away from the, what we should be talking about in a synthetic biology meeting. And I, I'm at fault in that, I'm afraid. There's a, there's a microphone right behind you, Tom. And, and then a lot of the stuff, the genome stuff, is, is you know, our, do we want to make self-replicating? And that's probably a lot further down the line. But, it, you know, the early on targets that NIH and, and that are useful as well as, as, as scientifically interesting uh, is, is what, you know, maybe a list of five or ten of them is what we maybe ought to be shooting for now. I could bring this back to um, a technical question. So the, the four-stage uh, synthesis reaction, the phosphoramidite-based chemistry uh, that's currently in, in practice even with the new on-chip technologies, um, is that going to hit a limitation at some point um, relevant to converting everybody in this room to de novo synthesis for all of their tasks? And do we need to go to a different synthesis chemistry, like a, a two-step process based on peroxide or something else? Uh, so any comments on work of that type going on and uh, whether it's necessary to push the synthesis technology past some critical threshold? I don't think there's... Oh, go ahead, John. I don't think there's any industrial drive to... Uh, none of the oligo companies are going to develop really better oligo technology. So there's not any demand for it. Uh, but to make this, I think that it's straightforward to see, it's not a complex problem, it's very straightforward to see how to scale down the cost of oligosynthesis, even on an individual basis, by, you know, the scale and cost by a hundred or a thousand fold. It's not a, I mean, it's not a huge project, it's a modest, uncomplicated project. That involves no new chemistry. Now, new chem, people have been working on the chemistry for a long time, and it's a, it's a fantastic chemistry from the point of view of organic chemistry. I mean, you get, you know, you get impurities at one part in 300. So, and in, and in terms of time, I think we have a long way to go until that's the rate limiting yeah. part of the process. Yeah. One of the things that might change is the purity of the starting product. Uh, you know, uh, as I understand it, the uh, the the phosphoramidites um, are not that pure to begin with. And so there's uh, uh, errors introduced, you know, simply simply from the purity of the uh, starting material. And the, again, if you make the analogy to the semiconductor industry, the critical thing, if you just look over the years, I mean, everybody plots transistors, number of transistors versus time uh, as an as a indication of the semiconductor progress. But that same plot could be done with, you know, purity of starting material versus time. In the middle? Well, I was just going to comment that rather just cutting out some steps is not nearly as powerful as using available technology in the, in the chip manufacturing. I mean, I think in this slide, there's 760,000 oligonucleotides that can be custom made in a typical time that you would per machine. Um, and that's probably not the upper limit either uh, for making oligos. 
Yeah. Roger. To pick up on the purity point, um, if that's so, then I think there are people in the room who know the answer to this. Uh, phosphoramidites are either going to go off patent this year or they just went off patent. Once they do, competition, and the competition can be based on things like purity. You had a question? I have a question, maybe that's answered best by Tom Knight. Um, when I'm looking at um, RNAs that are encoded in E. coli genome, for example, I have the feeling that in the last years we got to know a lot about ribose switches and other stuff, and which lets me expect that there is a lot of those RNAs which we have no clue about, and then we are optimizing those sequences, codon usage, how much of a problem is that if we are thinking about a whole E. coli genome? Uh, I think that's a real problem, and I think we've just seen the tip of the iceberg there. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, we're going to learn a lot more about that. And there's a whole other area, which is the whole area of histone binding and, you know, 3D structure of the chromosomes that uh, I'd, I'd, I'd say at least I'm clueless about, and I suspect a lot of other people are too. Yeah. I think the one reason that the exercise of doing a modest recoding on E. coli would be interesting is that it would force you to address a bunch of those issues. I'm, I, I don't think it. I think you'd be extremely unlikely to work if you codon optimized each one. But uh, if you make if you change a few codons, you're going to find a lot of issues as you go through it. It's a whole genome project that's got relatively straightforward design issues, and even those are big and complicated. I mean that. Well, that gets, gets back to the whole role of engineering here, uh, and you know, there's uh, you know, sort of a, uh, I think, a mantra in the engineering community that uh, you know that if you really understand it, you can build it, and uh, you know, I, I suspect that you know, we're not there yet, and we have a lot of work between where we are right now and being able to actually build these things. One thing that we will be able to do to expedite this a bit is using population genetics and comparative genomics of closely related species to look for uh, RNAs that are hidden in there and then use a synthetic biology to test those hypotheses on a massive scale. And to some extent, the goal of the modular part of synthetic biology that we heard about this morning is to get rid of those kind of things and move them somewhere else so that they're more modular. But I think we also heard that if something is not conserved, it does not mean that it's not important because it may be important that it's highly evolvable. We're, 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 we're talking about importance for engineering of biobricks. That's different from importance to the organism over a billion years of evolution. And from that standpoint, if you can still use the comparative genomics to, to give you a handle, that the key tool is going to be able to synthesize a lot of, walk through a bunch of hypotheses by synthesis. Quickly. That, yeah, quickly, right. So then you do find out what's important for your particular goals. but the, the, the large number of volunteers who helped pull together a lot of things on the fly um, and everybody for coming to this meeting. Uh, there'll be an announcement about the next meeting shortly and we'll get that to you. Uh, so thanks a lot and, and have, a, have a great trip back to wherever you're going. Yeah, um, I just wanted to remind you all